Okay, so welcome everybody. How are you? Where are you from? From Greece, from Spain, from Turkey? Well, as you can see, I'm a new person who is going to uh, to make the, the trainings. Hello, Dora. Hi. Um, well, so uh, as you have seen in the um, in the um, in the email that we sent um, in in Tuesday, I think uh, today starts the new activity, online youth action for a safer environment, and it's going to be held by FIPGAR, and I'm uh, I'm work at FIPGAR, and. And yeah, um, I'm going to introduce myself to you. I'm going to change to to change also my uh, name in Zoom. Okay, so um, my name is Carmen Coleto, as you can see. Um, I work at FIFGAR, as I said, as a project manager. Um, I studied law and human rights and governance. So I'm here to be your training for the next five trainings. So uh, hello to everyone. Um, okay, so first I'm going to explain to you the agenda of these trainings. I'm going to explain you all these uh, five trainings. So uh, I'm going to uh, share the screen. So let me know if you see my screen. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you guys. So, Let's start. Okay. Give me a second, please. Okay, so as I said, every Thursday we will conduct this uh, second activity, online youth action for a safer environment. And there will be five trainings. And during the, all these trainings, you have uh, some interactive activities and you will have to answer to uh, some questions during the, the sessions in, in Kahoot. And yeah, I'm going to be your trainer. Uh, something, someone say anything? All good, okay, thank you, Petrus. Um, so, okay. Um, in the first training, so today, we are we are going to discuss about what are human rights. Um, also, we uh, talk. Uh, we will talk about the what human what um, international and European human human rights law is, and which rights are affected by the environmental crisis. Okay, um, in the second training, we see, which is called um, hum sorry. <laughs> sorry. Human Impact on the Environment and International Agreements and Frameworks. Um, during these uh, second trainings, we will talk about the uh, specific uh, impacts of human, human beings on the environment. Um, about the agreements on environment, environmental and human rights issues. And finally, we will talk about this new and historical right to a health and, and a clean environment. Uh, okay, in the third training, please be concentrate in this part because um, uh, in this training, in the first, uh, well, we are going to discuss about uh, the most alarming environmental problems of our century. But at the end of the session, you will have to choose one environmental issue or environmental problem to do our research. So, for example, the pollution of the ocean. 
And you have to divide into groups according to what you have chosen. And once, once you have divided into these groups, you also uh, choose um, a real case study uh, about this problem. For example, if you have chosen the evolution of the ocean, of the oceans, um, you could choose uh, the Pacific Plastic Island. Um, so once you have done this, uh, you have to do some research about this real case. And I'm going to give you some uh, guide questions to, to answer uh, and to, to help you with the research. Okay, so. In the training four, which is the debate, um, in the first hour, you will be divided into these uh, into the groups that you uh, have done in the training three, and discuss the answer that you have uh, to the question that I uh, that you were asked uh, with your with your group and find a common answer to all these questions. And also you have to choose a, uh, a speaker to share with the rest of the groups uh, these conclusions and create like a debate. And finally, in the training five, which is called uh, Jaws, Jaws and Climate Action, uh, we will talk about why, why it's important for young people to defend the environment and how to get involved and take action in the, in the environmental movement. And also I'm going to give you some examples of Jaws and Climate Action. Okay. Um, the last thing, the, the last thing I want to um, to to say to to you it is that during all these sessions, you will have to answer these questions in Kahoot, and also we are going to have a break of two, of of ten or fifteen minutes um, in in its uh, training. Okay. So uh, let's start the training one. So. Give me a second to um to share the screen, the other screen. Okay. Okay, guys. So obviously you can interrupt me uh, in any time. You you can participate and and say whatever you you want. Okay. So, um, well, let's start this first training called Human Rights and the Environment. Okay, as I said before, we are going to, we are going to talk about the human rights, the international human rights law, and the European, uh, and which rights are affected by the by the environmental crisis. Crisis. Okay, so guys, the first qu question I want to ask you is, uh, what do you think are human rights? Uh, what are human rights for you? To you. Um, if anyone wants to participate, can say anything in the chat or, or maybe just to say anything. <laughs> I know it's a little bit difficult to participate, but don't be shy and say whatever you want. There are no wrong questions, wrong answers, so. Okay, guys, so we are going to continue. Okay, so officially, <laughs> the human rights are the, those rights inherent to all human, human um, beings because their mere existence, regardless their national, national, 
nationality, sorry, it's a difficult word for me to pronounce, nationality, the ethnicity, the language, or any other condition. These rights are interconnected and, um, and range from the right to life, which is the most basic, basic one, uh, to the rights that to the rights that improve uh, people's quality of life, such as their right to liberty, to food, or or to health. So basically, there are like uh, legal warranties uh, that that protect individuals and groups from the interference uh, from the uh, from interference of the states or any other actors. Okay. So guys, all their rights must be apply in accordance with a series of principles. And the first one, it is the unalienability, unalienability uh, which means that these rights must not be uh, denied or restricted by any state, but um, some governments could um, limit this exercise only in except situations, in exceptional situations. Uh, we are going to talk about later about this, uh, these uh, exceptional situations. Um, the second principle, it is the universality, which means that all people born with the same um, rights, regardless, as I said before, their sex, their, their religion, their culture, their sex orientation, or any other condition. Um, the indivisibility, which means that all human rights hold the same status. And what this means, okay, um, this means that mm, non-right is more valuable than the others. So this is why human rights are indivisible. And this is why another uh, principle of application, it, it is the interrelatedness, which means that the fulfillment of one of one right often depends wholly or in a part upon the fulfillment of uh, others. Um, also, we have the interdependence, which means that each right contributes to the fulfillment of a person's human uh, of a person's human dignity. Uh, the equality means that all individuals are equal as human beings, as you can imagine. This is very easy. Uh, Non-discrimination, also it is very, very easy. No one should suffer any discrimination by reason of race, uh, ethnicity, or any condition. And the last two principles, but not less important, uh, because there, there are two principles very important in our democratic society. Are the, is the first one, it is the participation and inclusion, which means that all people have the right to access and participate in information regarding the decision-making processes that affect their, their life and well-being. So any identified group such as um, the women, the youth people, the indigenous people have this right to access to access to all this information. And the last one uh, it is very, very relevant in our society. It is the accountability and rule of law, <clears throat> which means that the states and any other duty holders must follow and respect the, the laws and the standards set in the international human rights instrument. And if they do not do that, uh, the aggrieved, the person who, who has uh, suffered this violation or this abu abuse, have the right to initiate a procedure in order to uh, obtain the appropriate reparation. Uh, give me a second, I'm going to submit my... One second, please. Okay. Uh, okay, so we have the uh, first 
question in Kahoot. So you guys have to answer to enter in Kahoot.it in your mobile or in your laptop or computer or whatever. And then you have to enter a pin that I'm going to show you now. So please, uh, guys, enter to kahoot.it. Uh, mm -mm. I'm going to share my Kahoot screen. Another important thing, it is that um, it is that you guys don't close, please, the Kahoot tab. Don't close uh, the, the game because there will be another uh, questions later. So please, please, it is important to, to not close the Kahoot. Okay, let's wait to more participants. <clears throat> there are seven, seven persons, seven people. Okay, so Tiris, Dora, <laughs> let me know when you are ready, please. We are, we are nine now. Mari Nieves, okay. Do you have any problem to use the Kahoot or everything is okay? Please let me know. Okay, for the new participants, you have to enter in kahoot.it and enter the pin, this pin. <clears throat> you don't have to close your uh, Kahoot tab. Please don't close it because there will be more questions later. Okay, Micaela. We are 11. Okay, let's wait a few seconds and we start. Okay, well, trail. Okay, guys, so let's let's start. Okay, you have to read the question in my screen and also the answers. And in your mobile, you have to choose the the correct one. Okay, so we have only one question, right? 
and for wrong. So let's see who is the winner. Okay, Micaela, congratulations, Micaela. So we are going to continue with the training. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Um, so now, what do they cover? What uh, human rights cover? Well, so as you can imagine, human rights cover virtually every area of human activity. And these human rights can be divided into, into three groups, okay? The first one, it is the civil and political rights, which include the right to life, the right to freedom from torture, or the right to a fair trial. Uh, the second group, it is the economic, social, and cultural rights um such as the right to work the right to health uh, to create labor unions the right to to an education or to an educate housing this kind of of rights and the third uh, group is the collective rights um such as the right to development the right to self-determination or uh, the rights of indigenous people well so guys are all human rights absolute well so i said before that are some situations where when when a state can limit this exercise so could you guys think about uh, a situation when a state can limit the exercise of one right? If anyone wants to participate or to say anything in the chat. National security, yeah, Catherine, thank you so much. Anything, any situation that you can imagine? Okay, guys, so, um, okay, Petros, I, I'm asking you if, you, if you could think about a situation when the state or any state can limit uh, one, one human right, can uh, restrict one human right. I don't know if you you now understand the question. Of free movement during the coronavirus coronavirus pandemic, for example. Yeah, Andrea, thank you so much. So um for example, guys, um if an individual gives uh, North Korea, maybe uh, no, I'm I'm uh, asking about a situation or a state um, about when when a state can limit the exercise of one right. So, uh, for example, if in the individual use in um, in a bad way the right to freedom of expression or the right to participate in a demonstration that in the way that incites a racial, religious, woman, LGBTI community hatred, for example, or, or incites to war or to commit crimes, the states must limit the, the exercise of these rights to protect human rights of others. But any restriction always uh, must to be applied in accordance with the national laws and must be necessary to achieve the objectives and interest of our democratic society. Dora says the American law about abortions, maybe. No, I, I'm not saying that. So there is also another uh, situation. 
I don't know what you are uh, saying, Dora. The medical law about abortions, maybe. No. If you can explain me more. Okay, so the um, the other situation is um, when when, for example, when uh, another situation uh, when a state can limit the exercise of some rights, there there are when are armed conflicts, riots, uh, natural disasters, or public emergency, as uh, you have said coronavirus, pandemic, um, terroristic, yeah. Uh, any situation that pose a threat to the life of nation, basically. So in these situations, the governments may adopt measures to limit these rights by proclaiming the state of emergency. By, but to the, proclaim this uh, state of emergency, the states have to uh, comply with some conditions. Okay, the first condition is that the state of emergency must have been uh, officially declared. Um, also, uh, the second condition it is that these specific me measures must be formally notified to the competent international organization and other states parties. Um, this restriction, this uh, state uh, of emergency, is only admissible uh, to the extent extremely extric strictly required by the situation. So that is why this state must to be suspended as soon as the situation permits. And the last condition it is that the rights limited may may not be those that are prohibited from. Uh, being restricted, such as the right to life or uh, the provision on the pro prohibition on torture or slavery. Okay, so for example, um, uh, the Greek authorities in 2018 declared the state of emergency because of uh, of uh, one fire in the um, in the Attica region which uh, was very, very uh, big and, and in which uh, 102 people died. Uh, we can see here a photo of the Parthenon during this fire and uh, we can see the smoke. And I think this uh, image, this, this photo is uh, stunning because yeah, there are a lot of smoke. Okay, so uh, now we are going to talk about the international human rights law. But first, I want to ask you the, the second question in Kahoot. So please, guys, go to your Kahoot. Okay, if you are ready. Well, three, two, one. Oh. Yeah, I I am not sharing my screen, sorry. One second, please. One second, please. Okay. Mm. Okay, so guys, you have to enter again the pin. I'm so sorry. Please uh, enter this pin again.
Okay. Don't respond to these. We are going to go to the next one. Okay, this is the new question. Okay, we have six question rights and two wrong. So uh, we are going to know Kat is the winner. So congratulations Kat, also to Andrea and Dora. So uh, let's continue. Well, okay, so uh, as you have seen in the Kahoot, the first question was uh, after World War II. So uh, after this, uh, this time, representatives from 50 countries met in 1955 and draft the well-known Charter of United Nations, which gave rise to what, to what is known today as the United Nations with the aim of preventing future world wars like the one they just had suffered. And three years later, in 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was approved by the uh, United Nations General, General Assembly. And this document is quite important because it was the first time that any universal protection for fundamental rights was ever established. So um, also we, we can see the importance of this document because it is the uh, most translated document ever. It has been translated into over 500 different languages and has been uh, used by the newly independent states to draft their own constitutions uh, and to develop uh, new democracies. Um, the declaration has a preamble and 30 articles with uh, fundamental human rights and liberties of all people. But we have to remind, we have to remember that this document is not legally binding. And for those who don't know what this means, it is that um, this document doesn't include any mechanisms to obligate or to compel anyone into follow uh, these rights, these content, contents. So uh, even so, it is considered the cornerstone of our current international human rights law because this declaration is incorporated in many, uh, in many constitutions and, and legal frameworks. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm going to show you a video. Uh, let me share my... Okay, so I, I have here a video where they summarize very well what human rights are and the beginning of the human rights. The idea of human rights is that each one of us, no matter who we are or where we are born, is entitled to the same basic rights and freedoms. Human rights are not privileges, and they cannot be granted or revoked. They are inalienable and universal. That may sound straightforward enough, but it gets incredibly complicated as soon as anyone tries to put the idea into practice. What exactly are the basic human rights? Who gets to pick them? Who enforces them, and how? The history behind the concept of human rights is a long one. Throughout the centuries and across societies, religions, and cultures, we have struggled with defining notions of rightfulness, justice, and rights. 
But one of the most modern affirmations of universal human rights emerged from the ruins of World War II with the creation of the United Nations. The treaty that established the UN gives as one of its purposes to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights. And with the same spirit, in 1948, the UN General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This document, written by an international committee chaired by Eleanor Roosevelt, lays the basis for modern international human rights law. The declaration is based on the principle that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. It lists 30 articles recognizing, among other things, the principle of non-discrimination and the right to life and liberty. It refers to negative freedoms, like the freedom from torture or slavery, as well as positive freedoms, such as the freedom of movement and residence. It encompasses basic civil and political rights, such as freedom of expression, religion, or peaceful assembly, as well as social, economic, and cultural rights, such as the right to education and the right to freely choose one's occupation and be paid and treated fairly. The Declaration takes no sides as to which rights are more important, insisting on their universality, indivisibility, and interdependence. And in the past decades, international human rights law has grown, deepening and expanding our understanding of what human rights are and how to better protect them. So if these principles are so well developed, then why are human rights abused and ignored time and time again all over the world? The problem, in general, is that it is not at all easy to universally enforce these rights or to punish transgressors. The UDHR itself, despite being highly authoritative and respected, is a declaration, not a hard law. So when individual countries violate it, the mechanisms to address those violations are weak. For example, the main bodies within the UN in charge of protecting human rights mostly monitor and investigate violations. But they cannot force states to, say, change a policy or compensate a victim. That's why... Mm -hmm. So, guys, I think this video is very clear. And, um, yeah, I think it's good for you not only to hear my voice saying theoretical things. So, uh, let's continue. Okay. So, uh, since the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was only a public declaration of principles, the United Nations world worked on a normative structure that will convert these uh, principles into legal obligations. So that is why in 1966 were approved in the same year these two instruments, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Um, the first draft, draft of both the uh, documents was, sum was submitted to the General Assembly in 1954. So um, the adoption of these strategies was delayed by, 80, by um, 12 years. And so unlike the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, these both documents uh, were legally binding for all the signatory states. Um, which means that they are like a legal translation of the principles contained in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, because until this moment, until these two uh, documents, these uh, principles had no legal backing. So um, the Universal Declaration, together with these two, with these do two documents, uh, formed what is known the International Bill of Human Rights. Okay, so guys, in particular, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights um, has been ratified by 163 countries. And this document creates the Human Rights Committee that examines the degree of involvement of each member states uh, with, with all these rights. 
Um, okay, we have also the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights that currently has 161 member states and created also a committee uh, called the um, Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Um, and yeah, the, the aim of this committee was to uh, control the degree to which this covenant uh, is being followed or is being um, the, the states comply with this uh, document. So <clears throat> let's continue. There are also uh, other instruments that um, have continued to expand the international law of uh, for human rights for example uh, the, mm, this is the these are the main ones the mm, for example the convention on the on the prevention and punishment of the crime genocide from uh, 1948 uh, the convention to on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women from 1979, uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child from the 1989. Well, uh, you can see all these documents later, later because we are going to share with you the presentation in the Google Classroom. So, uh, well, here uh, it is um, an interactive map of the ratification of the 18 territories. So let's see it. Uh, okay, give me a second to share this screen. Okay. So uh, guys, which uh, country do you think it has uh, ratified the fewest uh, territories, the fewest territories? Could you think about a, a country? Could you think one country? Okay. Um, I understand you is difficult to participate. Don't worry. Um, the the um, the country who is ratified the fewest uh, theatre, it is uh, here, and it is Bhutan with only four theatres. Um, and we can see also the uh, in Europe most of the of the theatres has been ratified. And yeah, we have here the United States with only five theatres, but um well you you go you can see this map later uh with more time if you want so let's change okay so um a second please okay so um we already know all the instruments that the United Nations use to protect the human rights, but how they protect protect them? Uh, which institutions promote and protect uh, and protect these rights, and how they do it? How they put into practice all these uh, written documents? Well, so. For this purpose, there are some institutions. The first one it is the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, um, which is the main entity when it comes to human rights and acts as a secretary for the Council on Human Rights. Uh, also emits declarations about a situation related to human rights around the world and has the power to investigate and to uh, report on irregular human rights situations. Um, okay, also we have the Council on Humor, of Human Rights, 
uh, established in 2006. And now is the intergovernmental organism responsible and in charge of the promotion and protection of human rights around the world. Um, inside this council, this, uh, they discuss all human rights issues and relevant situations each year and make and makes recommendation to the member states. Uh, they also analyze the reports that the office uh, high commissioner makes. And they have um, a document uh, which is called Institution Building Package that provides with elements uh, this uh, council to guide the, the future of, of these institutions to, to help them to, to work, basically. So among these elements, there is the universal periodic review mechanisms to which the human rights situation in 192 member states are, will be examined. Also, we have, uh, they have the advisory committee, which serves as the council think tank, providing uh, with expertise on an advice on some thematic uh, human rights issues. And also they have uh, the complaint procedure, which is uh, very important because allows individuals and organizations to bring uh, human rights violations, human rights abuses to the attention of this council. And the last institution, uh, there is the there are the human rights treaty bodies uh, made up of uh, made up of experts or in each field who monitor the compliance with the covenants and conventions. For example, among them there is the uh, human rights committee, which oversees the implementation of the international covenant on civil and political rights, as I said before. But here we have a video where they explain the uh, human rights to the body. So we are going to see it. The most basic minimum human rights standards have been discussed and written down by countries. Countries have agreed to follow them, and these have become international law. Countries must ensure people can enjoy the human rights they have been promised. Under each of these laws is a committee of human rights experts that studies how well a country is living up to its human rights promises. Every few years, a country must tell a committee how well it's doing and where it is facing challenges. This is a periodic checkup to see that things are going in the right direction. It is an opportunity for a country to honestly reflect on its accomplishments and challenges. The committee of experts gathers information widely and studies the human rights situation of the country. The committee provides guidance to the country on the way forward. In some cases, people can complain to a committee if they believe their human rights have not been respected. Some committees can even visit countries to see for themselves what the human rights situation is. Find out what your rights are. Learn more about the UN Human Rights. Okay. I think this is very uh, useful for you. Uh, okay, so um, the European Human Rights Law. Um, we are going to talk about this because also since um, since the Second World War, uh, at the European level, there are there there are some instruments that has been adopted. Uh, so these are the main ones. The first one it is the Convention, the European Convention on Human Rights that was established by the Council of Europe in Rome in 1915 and entered into force three years later in 1953. Uh, this, this, was, th this instrument is quite important because it was the first time that to give effect to some of the rights set out in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and make them binding. Um, 
it has been ratified by 46 members member countries of the Council of Europe, including the 27 members of the European Union. Uh, this document also created the European Court of Human Rights uh, to which any individual who has suffered a violation uh, of the rights protected, protected by this European convention, convention can appeal to this court and, the, and this card is very uh, 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 special, is very relevant on an uh, international level because uh, the judgment of this court are binding in the country uh, in question, in the country where, um, where yeah, in the country that uh, make, makes these uh, violations. Okay, so. Uh, here is a video where you can see some of the rights included in this document. So these are some of the rights included in this uh, document. Uh, another instrument uh, important at a European level, it is the European Union Charter of Fundamental Rights uh, that was proclaimed in 2000 by the European Commission, the European Parliament and the Council of the European Union. And although this uh, charter was adopted in 2000, it entered into force in uh, 2009. And this document is an internal uh, instrument that obligates the, the European Union institutions and, legis and legislation to respect the fundamental rights contained in, in this charter. And it is also important because, because it brings together in one legally binding document, the most important freedoms uh, and rights of the European citizens. Um, okay, this charter also it is uh, relevant because it includes several rights that are not covered uh, by the European Convention. For example, the right to consumer protection and also include um, some rights that are already in this uh, uh, European Convention, but this charter extend, extends the, um, the, the content. For example, if we look at the protection against discrimination in the charters uh, also include some some more more reasons more more reasons to the, the to these discriminations they inc it includes the age the disability and the sexual orientation so um this is relevant because it's not uh, usual uh, for uh, for it's not usual to see in um similar documents uh, these these conditions. So thanks to their to these inclusions, it has been possible to increase the visibility of 
uh, these forms of discrimination. Okay, so um, the third question of Kahoot. So please go to Kahoot. I'm going to share the screen to you. Okay. So are you ready, guys? Let me know it, please, if you are, are ready. Also, if you see my screen. Yes, ready, okay, thank you. Ready, yeah, Evan, Dea, Petros, Catherine, thank you, thank you so much. So let's start with the three uh, questions, with the question three. Okay, we only have one answer, right? Six, two, two, wrong. Okay, so let's see who is the winner in this question. Okay, Kat is in the first position, then Andrea, then my Nieves. So congratulations. We are going to continue with the uh, training. Okay. Well, um, the, so as you can imagine, guys, um, the states party have uh, some obligation uh, with these international theatres and with these uh, uh, human rights. So they must uh, respect, fulfill, and promote and protect. Uh, with, Okay, the respect means that the states must and may never interference uh, or restrict the full enjoyment of, of human rights. But uh, I said before that there are some situations when a state can limit the exercise, for example, with the uh, state of emergency. Uh, the second one, protect, means that the states must protect individuals and groups from any violation of their human rights. And the last one, fulfill and promote, means, means that the states may adopt positive measures to facilitate the enjoyment of these of this, uh, human rights. Okay, but not only the state must follow uh, and respect these human rights, also companies must to do as well and also contribute to the sustainable development. However, uh, not only they often fail, fail to protect these rights, but also uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes provoke and worsen conflicts in their area of operation and lead, and lead to increase the poverty. Um, moreover, international human rights treaty do not usually impose direct obligations on companies, on companies, and also uh, most government don't have regulations in in relation to the uh, human rights and the impact that the business may have in these uh, human rights. Okay, that is why in 2011, the Human Rights uh, Council adopted the guiding principles on business and human rights, which is a document with uh, some elements to uh, prevent and address human rights abuses committed by business activities. So, um, well, guys, uh, I think I'm go we are going to do the, uh, the break. So uh, five or 50 minutes, 
uh, a take of five of, or 15 minutes or 15 minutes. So see you in a while.
Okay, guys, so I'm here again. Uh, we are going to continue. And in this second part of the training, we will discuss about which human rights are affected, as you see in my screen. So, um, we already know all the human rights instruments and what are human rights and all these things. And um, now we are going to, to, to see which rights are affected. So the, first of all, we have to remind that the promotion and protection of human rights and the environmental susta sustainability are interrelated and form the, the core of the sustainable development because uh, the environmental crisis are impacting to all the human rights. So to address all these problems and to achieve the sustainable development, we have to consider these two dimensions. We have to consider the human rights, but also uh, the climate crisis. And why the climate crisis and the, and the uh, um, human rights are interconnected? Well, I think it is obviously, but um, it is because the natural resources such as food, water are the basis of the realization of the most of the, of the human rights, such as the right to life, the right to food, the right to, to water. So this is why the sustainability cannot be achieved without legal frameworks that consider all dimensions of human rights. Okay, which rights are affected? Uh, all, uh, the climate change affect all the substantive rights, which include the uh, civil and political rights, such as the right to life, the economic and social rights, uh, for example, the right to health, the cultural rights, which um, uh, such as the uh, right to access to religious sites and also collect collective rights, such as the right to indigenous people. Okay, so in this regard, in regarding the, the right to life, um, which is the most basic one, as you know, the United Nations Human Rights Committee states that Climate change is one of the most pressing and serious threats to the availability of present and future generations to enjoy the right to life. So this is why it's important that the young people, the, the people like, like me, <laughs> um, um, we, are, we have to be aware, we have to be concerned about uh, this problem because we are going to suffer uh, the the impacts of, of climate change. Okay, so um, also the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, in his fourth assessment report already predicted that there will be an increase in deaths, uh, illnesses and injuries uh, caused by, caused by uh, heat waves, floods, fires and droughts and also in in this uh, in this report uh, they highlighted uh, the impacts of, of climate change uh, in the in the right to life um, such as the increase in in famine and malnutrition the um, the effect on childhood growth and and development and the increase in morbidity and the impact on cardiorespiratory mortality. So affects to um, all our lives. Okay, for example, the frequent uh, wa uh, heat waves we suffer here in, Euro in the European continent are becoming deadly by day, uh, specifically in Spain, Deaths attributed to head have already triplied the average of the last five years, and it is estimated that uh, 4,000 
700 deaths has been related to kids. Um, I remember the last summer, uh, it was a very, very hot summer and I suffered a lot because of that. Um, okay, um, here I, we have a, a video where they uh, explained, explained these uh, heat waves in, in Europe. So let's uh, put the, the video. Okay. So heat waves are increasing globally everywhere in the world um, as a direct consequence of, of global warming due to um, anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and in our recent study, we found that Europe is particularly affected uh, with an amplified heat wave trend that is three to four times larger than um, compared to the rest of the mid latitudes. We found that um, a specific jet stream state um, is related to a majority of um, this particular amplified trend. That jet stream state is um, described as a double jet with um, a very strong uh, band of winds um, to the north and to the south of the Eurasian continent. And this particular state is um, associated with very weak winds in the middle such that um, weather systems tend to be more persistent over Europe, which then leads to a um, yeah, higher risk of extreme heat. Yeah, they, they are to some degree what, what we expected um, under continued uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Scientists have been warning about uh, extreme heat waves for, for years. It's one of the clearest um, climate risk or the one that is um, directly attributable to um, greenhouse gas emissions and human activities. Um, the current heat waves are indeed um, beyond what uh, climate models uh, projected and highlight uh, that there might be specific uh, interconnections and models that are underestimated and there should be a warning to us that um, there are some risks that, that might be underestimated in climate um, change projections. Um, yeah, I think we should really be worried. Um, I understand that a study or um, an assessment report might not be too impressive when you just read the numbers, but if you experience this um, yeah, wave of heat waves, several heat waves affecting Europe, in particular the Mediterranean regions, France, Central Europe, uh, this year, um, that should really sh like come as a warning to us um, for what um, we will expect at a um, higher rate in future. And we will actually have to expect even more extreme heat waves, even more frequent heat waves. Um, if greenhouse gases are not mitigated. So yeah, this is a major problem that we are already suffering from. Um, I'm going to share the screen of the training. Give me a second. Okay. Okay, so... Um, so, well, I I I am uh, I I remember uh, news in the last summer here in Spain that had a lot of repercussion, and it was about a cleaning employee of the Madrid um, City Council who died of a, a heat stroke a stroke caused by the high temperatures, and after he fainted the day before also while working on cleaning tasks. And, uh, and I think it, it went viral because uh, here in Spain, we do not consider the, um, the, the heat like something 
dangerous, but I think that there are some workers that, for example, uh, work are working at 3 p.m. in the middle of July or, or August with 42 degrees and um, the, this, this, uh, this temperature is dangerous to, to these workers. So yeah, we have to be uh, more concerned about the, the heat waves and the, and the rising temperatures. Okay, so <clears throat> as you uh, as you figured, if the uh, if the um, right to life is uh, threatened uh, th threatened by the climate uh, crisis, also the right to life is also compromised. So this was uh, expressed by the Human Rights Council, with, which states that the Climate change is having negative negative impacts on clean air, safe drinking water, food resources, uh, and 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 inadequate um, housing. All these things together make up our our health. So, yeah, that it is a big problem. So, um, in this regard, the World Health Organization identifies. The main, the main health risk for climate change as more intense heat waves and fires, the increased prevalence of waterborne, foodborne, and, and vector-borne borne diseases, uh, increased the probability of malnutrition, or man, of malnutrition and uh, loss of work capacity among vulnerable uh, populations. Okay, so um, an example of uh, a threat to the to the right to health could be the rising temperatures that are expanding the territory where certain disease uh, carrying insects such as uh, ticks, ticks or mosquitoes uh, can survive. So um, these insects uh, can spread, can infect diseases such as the dengue fever uh, to new territories where the climate was previously unsuitable for them. And now because of these uh, temperatures, these high temperatures, these insects can survive and can spread and can infect with all these uh, uh, diseases to uh, more people. Uh, in particular, the transmission of the malaria has grown more than 30% in parts of the American continent and 40% in Africa since 1950. Okay, um, a very clear negative uh, impact on human health it is what is happening in the Sahel zone in countries um, as Chad, Mauritania, Burkina Faso, Mali, uh, in this, mm, in this uh, north of the, of the African continent, uh, where there are 29 million people suffering from malnutrition and more than 6 million people in high or acute malnutrition or above the normal levels. Okay, so regarding the right to to water, the the drinking water rights, the floods, droughts, and other water-related disaster are uh, increasing due to climate change. And given the population growth and the declining water availability in many in many places, the number of people suffering for from these phenomena will increase um, because the climate change affects the quantity and the quality of water resources. Um, regarding this, the uh, Amnesty International remind us that there are uh, 785 million people that have no access to water and sanitation. And uh, throughout the 20th century, the global water use grew more than twice, the rate of population increases, 
and this uh, dissonance is now leading uh, many many cities to like for example Rome uh, or Lyme to ration water because there is not uh, enough water to all the people that are demanding uh, more water uh, by day. So uh, because of that, this water crisis have been among the top, the top five hazards of the World Economic Forum's global risk almost every year since the um, uh, 2011. To, pardon, uh, sorry, 2012. Okay, so um, an example of uh, this phenomena um, during the 2011 in the Afghanistan suffered a long drought that severely, severely damaged uh, the country's crops, uh, driving many people into poverty and um, and leads to the impact uh, in, in the right to food to all these people. So according to the United Nations, around 265,000 citizens of Afghanistan have left uh, their homes and migrate to other areas due to uh, the drought. Uh, another example it is when in 2029, uh, heavy torrential rains left uh, severe, severe flooding in um, in Germany and Belgium, but also in Switzerland, uh, Luxembourg, and Netherlands. And in this uh, disaster, uh, died more than 180 people, and and hundreds of of people uh, went missing. Um, well, we can see a photo here in the about this uh, flooding, and the experts says said that it was the climate change they are responsible of the disaster because increases the probability of torrential rain. Uh, the German president uh, Frank Walter Steinmeier. Uh, during the visit to the uh, to the areas uh, to the affected areas, said that the whole places are scared by disaster, and many people have lost what they have built all their lives. Okay, so all these disaster uh, lead us uh, to the violation of the right to an adequate housing. Um, because the extreme water phenomena, extreme water weather phenomena due to climate change, such as the floods, the droughts, uh, the fire, the forest fire, uh, the sea level of rise, and all these uh, uh, kind of things, are destroying these people's houses and forcing them to ab abandon their homes and to migrate to uh, other areas. Uh, in this regard, the uh, Internal Displacement Monitoring Center in, two, in, in 2015 determined um, in, in its latest estimates that since 2008, 26.4 uh, 26 million people has been displaced by climate disaster every year, which means that 62 people uh, a day have had to leave their homes. And this figure is very high. So this trend is also expected to continue to increase due to the climate change. And according to this report, the largest increases in displacement are related to the adverse effects of, of the climate uh, of the climate change, and in particular with floods. Uh, but this institution only includes the internal displacement, so uh, they are not including the international migration. So this figure may be higher. Okay. The European Environmental Agency remind us that the climate change caused 100, 
50,000 deaths worldwide, worldwide in uh, 2000. But according to a new World, Organ World Health Organization study, say, uh, says that this figure will rise to 250,000 deaths per day in uh, 2040. In a documentary, I've seen that that in not so many years, some parts of the Miami may be underwater. Yeah, that is a very big problem. The sea level rise. We are going to talk about about it uh, later, Petros. Um, yeah, this is why we have to be uh, concerned. <laughs> Thank you, Petros. Okay, so uh, regarding the cultural rights. Uh, the special rapporteur in the field of cultural rights has already uh, states that the, that specific specific natural areas of certain populations are strongly affected by the climate uh, change. In particular, the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights um, states that the climate change have uh, negatively effects on the indigenous uh, peoples, including also their traditional knowledge, because they cannot still live in, in their ancestral areas that they are linked to their, their uh, religious culture, and they are forced to move to other locations. Um, so to the indigenous people, these uh, areas, these lands, uh, have a lot of uh, spiritual value for them. And if they cannot still live in, in these areas, affected direct, directly to uh, their right to, uh, to, to, to culture, to, re to religion, and also to, to their identity. Okay, so the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has noted that the sea level rise due to this climate change has impact on the, on the Pacific region. Uh, in this uh, small island, in this uh, small Pacific island such as Tuvalu or Vanuatu, which includes the traditional territories of many indigenous people, uh, so the very existence of uh, many territories is threatened by the cell level rise caused by the uh, climate change. Um, so indigenous people in this Pacific region uh, face a serious risk, risk to their, their, their lives, their livelihoods, but also to their cultures, I said before, to their ways to life, ways of life because they are intrinsically uh, linked to their traditional lands and territories. Uh, for example, um, their plantation or, or, or crops or, or livestock are, that are important things for these uh, communities are highly exposed to disease and pests associated with uh, flooding and other uh, climate variations. Well, here uh, we are going to see a video of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Tuvalu, Simon Coffey, who participated in the last uh, COP26 in the Glasgow Summit uh, with a video where he appeared to the, um, to, to the water up to his knees to send a, a message to the rest of the world. So we are going to see it. In Tuvalu, we are living the realities of climate change, sea level rise, as you stand watching me today at COP26. We cannot wait for speeches when the sea is rising around us all the time. Climate mobility must come to the forefront. We must take bold alternative action today to secure tomorrow. Paftailasi, Tuvalu Modeatu. Climate change and sea level rise are deadly and existential threats to Tuvalu and low-lying atoll countries. We are sinking, but so is everyone else. 
And no matter if we feel the impacts today, like in Tuvalu, or in a hundred years, we will all still feel the dire effects of this global crisis one day. In Tuvalu, our islands are sacred to us. They contain the mana of our people. They were the home of our ancestors. They are the home of our people today. And we want them to remain the home of our people into the future. This is why this call to you from Tuvalu is not just a political statement. It is a call that reverberates from our eight islands and our 12,000 people to the international community. Okay. Um, let's continue before this uh, speech. Uh, well, here we can see um, a photo with this slogan, we are not drawing, we are fighting used by the activists of this uh, island, of this Pacific island, to remind us that, um, yes, the, they are suffering from uh, climate change, but they are also uh, fighting for, for their rights. Uh, for example, Vanuatu, uh, which is the, the most, one of the, of the states most affected, from the climate change, uh, the last year presented a proposal to the United Nations General Assembly to ask the, uh, interna the International Court of Justice for an, uh, for an opinion on the obligation of, a state, of a states to protect human rights in the face of the adverse effects of climate change. And um, they want to do that because although the court's opinions are not binding, um, these opinions have um, a very great uh, symbolic, symbolic uh, significance for the, uh, commu the international community. And some tribunals can uh, use these opinions to make uh, their own uh, judgments. Okay, and uh, the, the last group of rights affected by uh, this uh, climate change are the procedural rights um, that are those uh, that directly or indirectly affect the proper prosecution of crimes that harm substantive rights. Uh, this may include access to information, civil society participation in decision-making and on legislation processes, uh, or maybe the right uh, to effect judicial protection. Uh, for example, um, this is why the Court of Justice of the uh, European Union showed how lengthy administrative procedures to pursue an environmental right were a violation a violation of the right to a fair hearing with a, within a reasonable time, uh, which means that an excessive uh, lengthening of, procedure, of procedural time uh, will be a violation of, of human rights. And here we have a, a video where they explain the impact of climate change on human rights and the connection between them. It's the findings of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that tells us that principally Climate change is the result of the actions of human beings and human institutions. In other words, it's not an accident of nature. It's the direct result of policies and practices in the public and in the private sectors. So that means it's principally human-induced. If you hold that against the obligations of all states in the world to promote and to protect human rights and to take affirmative steps, not just to stand back and, and not violate human rights, but to actually take steps to protect human rights, you see a direct conflict. We think a direct breach of those human rights obligations. Taking steps to cause climate change represents a breach if it impacts directly on human rights. And we know that it does. 
What we want to see is that the response in Paris and beyond is one that takes account of the human rights impacts of climate change. So for example, we know as a matter of evidence that climate change directly impacts on the right to health, the right to water and sanitation, the right to adequate housing, even for people living on small island developing states, the right to self-determination. Where is your self-determination when you're compelled to become a climate migrant and to leave your homeland and find yourself as a climate refugee somewhere else? And of course, it can impact directly on the right to life. And we know that thousands have lost their right to life as a direct result of climate change. It's important that in the response, there is accountability for breaches, that those who are responsible for climate change and its impacts on human rights are held accountable through effective regulation, through effective policies to make sure those harms aren't caused and where they are, that there is redress for those harms for victims. We want to make sure that the human rights principle of participation is respected and integrated into the responses so that those people most affected, often indigenous peoples, minorities, migrants, persons with disabilities, older persons, and as I said, people living in small island development states or coastal communities, that their voices are heard in the response, are respected and are responded to. We know that the two degree limit, which is the target for Paris, um, will help us to avoid the worst harms from climate change, including harms on human rights, but it will not help us to avoid all of them. If we are well beyond that target in Paris, that's not just uh, an intergovernmental political challenge. It is a very fundamental human rights challenge. We want to make sure that states are aware of that, aware of their obligations, and that they respond in a way that will address those obligations effectively. If we don't get the kind of agreement that we need around the limitation of carbon emissions, around financing so that developing countries can take the steps they knew, need to reposition their own economies in ways that uh, uh, are climate neutral and are green, uh, to, to use the term. Um, if that doesn't happen, uh, we're going to need to see a much stronger human rights response to this challenge. Okay, guys. That was the video. And now we have the last question in Kahoot. So uh, let's change to the Kahoot. Um, I'm going to share my screen, my other screen. Uh, give me a second, please. Um, okay, here. So let me know when you are ready, guys, because it's the last question. Um, Okay, are you ready? Are everyone ready to the last question? Ready? Okay, Catherine, Andrea, Sotiris. I don't know if I'm pronouncing uh, uh, well your your names, but <laughs> Eva. Um, okay, thank you guys. So uh, let's start with the uh, last question. Um, okay. So, here it is. Okay, anyone has the right answer? It doesn't matter. Um, we are going to see who is the winner of the whole uh, Kahoot. In the third one, Mari Nieves. In the second, the Andrea. And in the first one, we have a cat with uh, 917 uh, uh, points. So congratulations, guys. Uh, congratulations, my Nieve, Andrea, Kat, and everyone who has participated. I'm very grateful for that. Um, <laughs> Catherine, oh, yeah. Um, thank you all for uh, participating and for being here. And I hope that you enjoyed this, um, this training. I tried my best to to do it and um, 
Uh, we are. We will see you in uh, in in Thursday again. So thank you, Catherine. It was fun. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you. Thank you for you for all. And thank you, Catherine. Also, thank you, guys. Thank you so much. So see you on the ne next Thursday. Uh, all the presentation and the link to the to the videos or and all these things will be um, uh, in the Google Classroom. That uh, I think this afternoon I'm going to send to you an email with uh, all these things with the uh, Google Classroom activity and this kind of thing. So I hope that you enjoy it and see you on the next Thursday. Bye, guys.